Stand Naked in the River of Shame, written and directed by Evan Edwards. Cast of characters, Franklin, played by Arthur Gregory Pugh, Caleb, played by Sidney Greenstein, and Boy, played by Brendan Weber. Setting, a pond on an abandoned farm in rural Florida. It's now littered with various debris, including an upturned wooden slate slat crate. It was once idyllic and beautiful. Time, just about sunset, August 5th. It ain't none of your damn business why I wanted to come here, woman. If you keep sassing me, I'm gonna make you go pick a switch, just like I did when you were little. Calling me Franklin like we friends. People get grown and forget who they daddy is. Make a man sick, sicker than he already is. Now go away and leave me be. <sighs> Woo! Lord Jesus, that was a walk and a half. Don't remember it being this far away. But I made it. I made it. You can take the leash off this old dog and let him play up around in here for a minute. I may be dying, but I ain't blind, deaf, and dumb. I see you lurking. Why don't you come on over and give your old daddy a hand while they take a piss? <laughs> I knew that would make you turn and walk away. Go play your candy game on your laptop phone thingamajig. <sighs> yes, sir, E. Franklin. You done made it all the way here. It took you damn near 60 years. But you come back. You come back. Now, let me take a look at the place real good. Seems like ain't nothing changed. Still got the pond right where I left it. Still overrun with cattail. Mm. Could hardly swim up in there for all the cattail. Couldn't swim in it now, no way, with this old heart of mine. But it do us so good to be back anyways. Yes, sir. It do us so real good to be back. <sighs> you ain't fooling nobody. Nobody at all. I know you're there. I can see you out the corner of my eye. Might as well come on out. Caleb slowly steps out from behind the cattails. What you doing here alone? They say this place is haunted. Ain't you scared? Nah, I don't believe in ghosts. Do you? Sure. But around these parts, flesh and blood, wearing white sheets and hoods, scare me more. I'm sorry, mister. I didn't know anyone owned the place. We hoped we could buy it one day but we never got the chance. If this land ain't yours, what are you doing out here? <laughs> I could ask you the same. I'm just minding my business like you should be. Oh, now you feeling yourself. What you planning on doing? Jumping a feeble old black man? I'll call the police. Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> Nowadays, police will kneel on your neck just for looking at them funny. What you think gonna happen if they come here and see a big old black man with a half naked little white boy? That's just asking for a heap of trouble. I don't want trouble. Been in too much of it lately. I know that feeling. So, is that why you out here? Well, if truth be told, can I trust you to keep a secret? Depends on how juicy it is. What's the tea? What? Never mind. Forget I said anything. No, now, come on, boy. I'm just joshing. I could care less about you and your secrets. So spill. Well, the truth is, I'm up here waiting for a friend. It's sort of kind of a long-standing date. Hmm. This spot seems a bit romantic for a sort of kind of date. Uh, hopefully it'll be us one day. But why here? This place ain't nothing. First time we met was here on accident. Now we come here to go swimming. Afterwards, we'll lay in the sun, soaking in the warmth, just 
Hawk. It's the only thing I have to look forward to. You know, there are better places around town to go swimming. I mean, what if something happens? Ain't nobody hardly know this place at all. That's why we like it. Ain't nobody come around to mess with us. And yet, here I am. But could you not be? Like I said, I'm expecting my friend any minute. So you want me to leave? Yes, sir. And what you gonna do if I don't? Well, pretty little white boy, naked and hollering in the company of a rumpled old Negro could get the police here lickety split. I know you ain't gonna do that. Too much trouble for both of us, remember? Oh, dang it, you're right. If my daddy was to find out I was up here again, that'd be the end of me for sure. Going against your daddy? Ain't gonna end well, not for nobody. Trust me, I know. Mister, if you could spare me the sermon and skedaddle, there won't be any problems. None at all. <sighs> if only that were true. It'd be best if you went on home. I can't, I told you. I got a prior engagement right here, right now. But um, what if your friend don't show today? Uh, with you here, that may just come to pass. Would that be something bad? I mean, you could just forget about all this and get on with your life. Listen, it's none of your concern, so why don't you just go on home and get? That's exactly what you need to do. Avoid all the trouble and the name calling, the beating and the- uh, oh, What are you talking about? What beating? Ain't nobody here but us. And if I need to, I can take you down, old man. That's so unlike you. You don't fight. All this sneaking around, Caleb, it, it's changing you. It's not changing. Hold up. I, I never told you my name. <sighs> Caleb. How do you know my name? I never said it. it. It's hard to explain. Well, if you can't explain why you know my name, don't bother using it. Just go on and leave me be. Caleb, I'm here to tell you, you got to go on home. You said that already, and I'm not going, so you get. Your friend ain't coming. You a dang lie. My friend always comes. It's a long-standing date between us, and I'm counting on it, especially today. We always do right by each other, me and. Fine. Your friend does come, but leaves way too soon. How can someone come and leave too soon when they're not even here yet? Boy, you ain't making this any easier. Listen to me. I wanted life to be different than what it was, but I got dealt a raw hand. I did my best to deal with it, to move on and let it go. I tried to live a normal life, a life without the pain, without the struggle, without the hurt. But not one damn day did it not hurt. Not one day in the last 60 years was I not filled with regret and loss and longing. You don't know what I mean. You will never know what I mean. Why don't you just say what you mean so I could know? On second thought, why don't you just get back to shoveling horse shit? That's all you people are good for anyway. You don't mean that. Why, sure I do. In fact, I don't even know why I lowered myself to speak to the likes of you in the first place. That's your daddy talking, Caleb. That ain't you. Hush up. You don't know me, and you don't know my daddy. I met him. Sort of. But only once. The day we lay... Uh, uh. The day we what? This is the first time I laid eyes on you, old man. We haven't done anything together before, ever. The day you, you. Why are you so full of unfinished sentences? Makes me wonder what else is unfinished in your pitiful little life. So much. But after today, maybe nothing. There you go again, making no sense. So much, maybe nothing. I think you lost your darn mind. You need help. There's something you need to know. Get away from me, crazy person. Stay the heck away from me. No, I gotta tell you this. You gotta know. You're right. 
Your friend does come. He always came. But that last time, Franklin wasn't alone. How do you know my friend's name? A group of boys followed Franklin. How do you know our names? You've been the one telling us. Those boys followed Franklin and hit the cattail at the end of the pond, just like you did earlier. The sun must be getting to you. Best you be going now. Get on home and rest, old man. I can't rest, not till I tell you. Them boys, them white boys, they waited till they saw you and Franklin. Don't you say nothing bad about Franklin. Don't you dare say nothing bad. After you and Franklin done kissed. We never did no such thing, no sir. After you kissed for the first time. Liar, how dare you insinuate we ain't. Them boys waited till Franklin got into the pond. They grabbed you and beat you till you laid in a bloody... What is wrong with you? You got polio or TB or something? Franklin heard your screams, but he ain't came to help. He hid in the cattail at the deep end of the pond. You ain't making any sense. Those boys would have killed Franklin just as sure as look at him. So he stayed in the pond for hours got pneumonia and weakened his heart. Mister, you're all mixed up. Franklin ain't dead from a weak heart. He's on his way here right now. After it's when I saw your daddy. I can still hear them boys yelling through the window of the funeral parlor. There he is. Get him. That's the nigga that killed Caleb. What? I ain't dead, I'm standing right here. And Franklin, he'd never do anything to hurt nobody, especially not me. You were the mayor's son. Them white boys had to blame the only person who knew the truth. So they just kept yelling, get the rope and get him. And the people in town, they listened to him. Stop it, that's sick. You're a sick person. Get him, lynch him. That little nigga Franklin killed Caleb. Stop saying his name like that. He killed that white boy. He go swang. Don't let that little nigga Franklin out of your sight. Keep his name out of your filthy mouth. Franklin stumbles back to the crate. Say his name one more time. I swear, for God, there'll be hellfire to pay. So I ran. I ran for 60 years and ain't come back. Who are you yelling at? I said, who are you yelling at? Huh? Nobody. Ain't nobody here to yell at. Good, because I've been planning something special. No, please. Anytime we're together, it seems special to me. It do to me too. Don't! But I want to remember this day, August 5th, in the summer of 1946, for the rest of my life. Don't do it! Boy kisses Caleb. No! I'm gonna live in this moment forever. I knew you would. I knew you would stay here for all time. Come on now, let's get to swimming. I'm so sorry I left you. I'm sorry I didn't help you back then. But I'm here now, today, August 5th, 60 years to the day of your... <laughs> you gotta go. You got to get out of here, both of you, together, please. Oh, oh. Please, let me save you this time. Let me do right by you. Franklin, uh, this place is giving me the willies. I heard it's haunted. So? I don't believe in no ghosts. All the same, 
Let's not go swimming today. Let's go back into town. I'll get us some ice cream. Ice cream? You ain't gotta ask me twice. Last one there is a rotten egg. Caleb walks over to Franklin. We always do rap by each other. He kisses Franklin on the cheek. You can rest now. Hey, Franklin, wait up. Blackout, end of play. Yeah, so Aaron, should I begin? Yes, please. A letter to Derek, a short monologue for the stage by Michael Alberstadt. Main character, John. A fit, bispeckled lad, 16, in a disheveled dress shirt and khakis. Walked into third period English that first day like your shit was the entree at lunch. The pretty people were warm for your form, the nerds feigned disinterest, but they knew a badass when they saw one. God, I could have built a house on your shoulders, a Frank Lord Wright Prairie style, boom, right there. But I was nobody. And that was fine with me. I saw you in class and in the lunchroom. Sometimes after school, I would sit in the stands and watch you practice. And at the football games, what a great A stud. You had total command of the gridiron. Great arm, quick on your feet. I, I was, I was smitten. As a school mascot, I kept the fans energized. I performed gymnastics, teased the pom-pom girls. I can imagine you rolling your eyes. But it was tough, especially dressed as a beaver of all things. I like to think I fired up the crowd and the fans and maybe inspired the team. <laughs> no, really. I did things I would never do. That costume was my armor. It let me totally become someone else. I watched you from where I changed in the locker room. You were always just filthy. You, like you brought the field in with you. Grass on your legs, and dirt on your face. And all that protection you removed, helmet, pads, your cup and pants, and your uh, jock. I watched you in the shower, the lather running down your... I remember you asked me once why I never showered with the team. There was no way. I mean, with you in there, no way in hell. Traveling with the team was an education in young jock culture. I kept to myself, but your asshole teammates still razzed me hard. You didn't, but you never defended me either. I think they call that plausible denial. And then there was that trip we had when the team bus broke down in uh, Macosta, remember? We had to stay overnight in that flea bag motel and coach divided us into quads and no one wanted to sleep with the beaver until you volunteered out of the blue just just volunteered i couldn't imagine why butch and moe's were big ass linebackers so you gave them the big ass bed and we got the cozy pull-out sofa it was small we couldn't really get away from each other and We didn't. <laughs> Thank God they snored. <laughs> you had your butts handed to you by um, Brother Rice in the playoffs, so postseason arrived. The other guys ignored me. Um, and I thought, well, that stuff we did, it, it, it must have been a fluke. And one night you tapped on my second floor window. You had climbed the drain pipe, but did I wonder why you were hanging there Hell no, you were there. I let you in and you didn't say anything, not a word. You just led me into my bed and we just... I started leaving the window unlocked and 
you'd slip in and and strip off your clothes and climb into bed and we'd <laughs> dear god would we and in those moments you were tender and giving and funny a derrick nobody saw but me we never spoke in school or went on a date or shared a banana split <laughs> i met vanessa in spanish class and we started she wanted to date someone so uh, but you had every pair of boobs in school chasing you of course big football stud plays the field recruiters want manly men with manly exploits i get that i'm not an idiot when i saw you banging that kruger in your wrangler after the homecoming game I, look timing and influence they're everything and I know you were desperate for that scholarship, so I, I just, it, it hurt. It really hurt. I didn't know where we stood. At least until that stupid student council secret Santa thing, you know, where someone can send a secret gift to someone else. God, what were you thinking? A box of rubbers, Trojan Magnums ribbed, no less. Then someone started a rumor that the football team was giving it to the beaver and well, they were almost right. It wasn't flowers or a night at the multiplex. It was condoms when I wanted words. But when we were alone, you kissed me and gave yourself to me completely. That seemed like enough. Then Valentine's day, you sat behind me in algebra that day, remember? Student council did that thing where you sent your Valentine a rose, so I sent one, red, your favorite. You sat so close behind me that if I leaned back in my chair and you leaned forward, I could feel the safe, comforting heat of your body. And you said you needed a pencil, so I turned to give you one, and, and you smiled at me. And I knew in that moment that you loved me. My heart just leapt. I heard the classroom door open and you looked past me and I thought the roses were being delivered, but, but your smile vanished and I saw your game face. You stood suddenly and ran right at some guy in the doorway. Then I heard the gunshots. They said, you were dead before you hit the floor, but your momentum knocked him over. And it was enough for the others to jump on him. He would have killed dozens. I was in the front row and you ran right at him. No pads, no helmet, no protection. Who does that? Who runs at a shooter without, I mean, anything? So today, um, the day of your memorial service, I wanted to write it all down before it fades, before it's taken away from me. Vanessa has been great. Very high school girlfriend, very empathetic, though she didn't seem to like you very much. She thought you were too full of yourself. She's an idiot. Uh, she gave this football to me? Uh, out of the blue, your mom found it in your closet sitting alone on the shelf and knew she'd get it to me. You. You wrote a note on the damn thing, a note to me, John, a game ball for the beaver, Derek, number five. And you put XO under it. Are you ever gonna give it to me? Or couldn't you get past the manly man, just got the football scholarship stud image? You saved my life. Vanessa says I should wear a suit because that's what you wear when you memorialize a hero. John climbs into the mascot outfit. 
I can't do it. I can't be that shattered kid sobbing in his chair because of the horror of it all. That kid who ends up on the evening news. I need the armor. I need to be that nobody on the sidelines embracing the crowd, showing them that, that we survived, that we will go on with Derek and with Emery. Our leader, our quarterback, our Derek. <sighs> I need my armor. So when I cry for my Derek, nobody will know. As in love, no death. John puts on the mascot head. Fade out. Lickety Split by Alfonso Ramirez, directed by Aaron Levitman. Cast of characters, Hector, played by Mark Vaughn, and Nancy, played by River Coelho. Setting, a beauty salon. Hector lounges in his salon chair. A doorbell rings. Come in, please. Come in, please. Busy? Oh, no, it's been busy all morning. This is the first chance I've had to breathe. I'll come back another time. Oh, no, no, no. No, um, you're the first pretty girl I've had uh, for um, at least an hour. We prefer to be called ladies now. Oh, beg your pardon, mademoiselle. Are you cold? Should I turn the temperature up a bit? No, I just had a momentary discomfort. It's the hormones. Well, you see, chivalry is not dead. <laughs> Maybe on life support for um, it's still kicking, as the young folks like to say. So, what do you fancy today? Trim, blowout, highlights? I've been in hibernation so long that, believe it or not, I've got split ends and my roots are out of control. I just can't stand it anymore. Well, have a seat here and we can take care of that lickety split. That's an expression I haven't heard in a while. Mm. I use it around my son all the time, but he never got the point. Right away, go clean your room, I'd say to him, or uh, on the double with the trash, or too sweet, brush your teeth. You have a kid? I used to have a son, Jordan. Used to? What hmm. happened? I'd rather not talk about it if it don't bother you none. Did he die? For all intents and purposes, yes. Here. Well, you put a cape around you to protect that beautiful blouse and skirt. Ooh, looks fancy. Wouldn't want to cause any damage. <laughs> no. That was second hand. Everything I own now is either borrowed or a hand-me-down. It took some getting used to. I call it pandemic couture. <laughs> That's funny. Now, about your hair. Well, this is an odd color. I'm not exactly sure what you call it, but it's definitely not a color found in nature. I doubt if I can replicate it. Maybe I'll just settle for a trim. I'm still getting used to, I'm getting over some changes in my life and nothing. Besides, I, I'm in a bit of a hurry. I have a doctor's appointment right up the street in an hour. Are you okay? Uh, should I get some sanitizer? <laughs> yes, not what you're thinking. I'm just running low on my meds because of awesome. COVID. My insurance insists I see a specialist before they can approve renewal. It's been so frustrating. Frustrating. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine doing other people's hair wearing uh, rubber gloves and a face mask and standing six feet away from your client? I closed for five months before I was allowed to open again. 
I know. I'm glad you opened up. I stopped by here last time. I saw my doctor three months ago. Everything was all boarded up like... Fort Knox? Mm -hmm. Now the damn doorbell won't stop ringing. I even hear the thing in my sleep these days. <laughs> it's like a bad Taylor Swift song that you can't get out of your head. <laughs> I agree. Sometimes it's hard to tame your brain to ignore those repetitive messages. Mm -hmm. I struggle with that a lot of my life. Well, let's get back to your hair before we are rudely interrupted. Now, did you want to keep this color or can we go back to the original one? I mean, this won't take long. I'm fast and furious with air dye. Okay. The original sin sounds good. Great. Now, I can match the color I see in the roots, but let's take it a shade lighter. What do you say? On board, Captain. Wow. I used to say that to my son. <laughs> Just gave me goose pimples. What's your name? Nancy. Well, I'm glad to make your acquaintance. And I'm Hector. Hector. How do you know that? Uh, it's printed right above the sign on your doorbell. Oh, oh, <laughs> you had me spooked there for a second. <laughs> it was like a uh, deja vu all, all over, over again. again. Who are you? Am I being pranked? I already told you. I'm Nancy. Isn't that what you used to call me for practically the first 15 years of my life? Nancy this and Nancy that, among other nicknames. Those are just the nice ones. One time you said you were going to take your cigarette and burn it into my forehead like a tattoo. I'll bet you don't remember that gruesome little detail. No, it's Nancy now. It has been for two years. You still don't listen. What happened? Isn't it obvious I became the person I was supposed to be? The person whom you hated and teased? The kid you tortured is gone now. This is the new me. I'm, I'm speechless. For the first time in your life. I don't get it. Why would you do this? You always told me to face up to my truth. I'm in the slow and difficult process of doing that. I don't believe it. I can't understand. I have what's called gender dysphoria, mismatch. The outside of me is finally beginning to match the inside. How can that be? I mean, you were born with a penis. You had testicles. I was there, I distinctly remember that part. Well, you'll be happy to know I still have them. I haven't taken that last step yet. The procedure is super expensive. I read somewhere that it's not what's between the legs that dictates gender, it's what's between the ears. I've been taking hormones and working to modulate my voice. This is mind boggling. I, I can't get used to this. You have no choice now. This is me. This is who I am now. Well, why did you choose the name Nancy? That's crazy. I always hated how you mocked me when you made me feel bad for my lack of masculinity. I took the name Nancy to take back the power from you, to own it, to have dominion over you. Why'd you come here? What did you expect for me to embrace you and say, it's all good and welcome back after five, five years. years? It was exactly five years ago this month you kicked me out. Right around the first anniversary of mom's death. Now I get to celebrate two important dates at the same time. No, no, you left of your own volition. Don't blame me for this. That's not how I remember it. You said, and I'll never forget this, if you can't live by the by the rules of this house and act like a man, then leave and don't come back. Oh, and you added lickety split for emphasis. Do you recall how drunk I was that night? You were drunk almost every night. Exactly. And that night in question, you came out of your room thinking I wasn't home and you were wearing your mom's clothes, the full Monty. Her 
hair, her shoes, her dress, her wig, her makeup, even the favorite shade of nail polish. Pomegranate passion. It was uncanny how much you resembled her. I lost it. I couldn't deal with seeing her. It was like she was standing right there in front of me again. It was painful. And FYI, that's the last night I had a drink. I've been sober for five years. Well, goody for you. I'm the one who had to deal with your alcoholism and your verbal abuse all those years. And now you tell me you're sober. Do you know how much pain I was in? Have you any idea how alone I felt, abandoned by both my parents? Might as well be a freaking orphan. Okay, you don't need to yell. God, you sound just like your mother when she used to get mad at me. And you kind of resemble her too. Is that a bad thing? No. I still remember everything about her. I miss her. Especially now when I need her help coping with these changes in my body and my mindset. It would be nice to have her around for this second puberty. Where did you go? I mean, how, how did you survive? I had couch surf for a while. I graduated high school and took some college courses. I was working as a waitress at a bar until COVID crashed the party. So why did you come here? What do you want from me? Approval? A hug? Do you want me to say that I love you unconditionally? Is that it? All of those things would be nice. But no. I actually want to borrow money from you. Having problems paying the bills after COVID? I need money for the vaginoplasty. That's a lot to swallow. I need to think about this. You had taken me by surprise. I'm sorry I asked, I'll just leave. No, wait, wait, don't go. When do you need the money? How much do you need? I need it by the end of the year and it's $30,000. That's more than the price of cosmetology school. Uh, uh, and a license. It's like a whole year of rent. Holy shit. Seriously? Wow. Did you want to sit down? I hope you're not having a stroke. No, I'll be okay. I know it's a lot, but my insurance won't cover it all. Plus, I haven't worked in almost a year. I'll have to think about it. This isn't easy. Are we talking about the money or am I being here? Would you prefer if I disappeared again? Jordan, I mean, Nancy, I was a different person then. I've grown a lot and I've changed. And I am sorry I failed you. And I'm really sorry for everything I said and did to you all those years ago. Does it help at all to hear that? It's a start. I want to ask something of you. I want you to think about this ultimate step seriously before you take it. I don't want you to regret anything. I have so many regrets for the way I acted and for the things I said. I wouldn't want you to go through this until you're absolutely positive. My therapist says the same thing every time I see her. Thanks for at least hearing me out and considering this. Here's my card with all of my information. That's a great photograph. You do look so much like your mom. It's gonna take a long time to think of you as a girl. I mean, as a woman. Is my daughter? <laughs> Try saying that with a little more conviction. You'll get used to it. Plus, you had a head start all those years ago. Hi, Dad. Wait, 
What what about your hair? We never started the process. I've started my process, thank you. The hair can wait till next time. Uh, survive this long, another few weeks won't matter. By the way, I lied. My name's still Jordan. I am still me. Goodbye, kid. End of play. Apophenia by Bill Crouch, directed by Cedric Hill. Cast of characters, Michaela, played by Jennifer Jackson, Ned Bailey, played by Jonathan Fry, Archer Bailey, played by Teddy Alexis Rodriguez. I didn't know her as a friend. I knew her as a teacher, coworker, perhaps a future mother-in-law. My name is Michaela. Her name was Charlene. We've been gone a long time now. We are remembered by her sons, Ned and Archer. I knew her as kind. I knew her as, well, a person the children love. Charlene was that kind of person, rare, even in school, a place where everyone should be kind to children. But this is not always so. But before I tell you of her, I should tell you of me. I have worked in this school for a long time. I have become an administrator. I am the director of facilities for the Western Region of the Board of Cooperative Educational Services, which is a compendium of schools that specialize in teaching children with disabilities. Many have multiple barriers to education and employment, but before any of that, many have a hard time speaking. Many have a hard time communicating what they're feeling, which is hard for them. You and I can communicate what we feel by age two or three. We tell mommy and daddy that we are hungry or frightened and someone responds. This is not always so for many of the children that attend our school. So when they are hungry or frightened, they might cry or they might lash out or they may fall silent. Silence is the worst for them. Charlene knew that. I watched how her children, her students, how they brightened in her presence. As soon as they entered her classroom, they brightened. Oh, suddenly full of life as she was. Many of the silent ones became talkative because they knew she was listening. Not to their words, to their insides. I don't know how to put it any better than that. She heard their thoughts, no, no, their confusion. No, I don't have a word yet. She listened and so they spoke. Oh man, what a day. Here, eat that jerk. Oh, an apple for the teacher. Again? There's like 20 of them in the fridge, little brother. Okay, Mr. Stating the Obvious, thanks. I know, it's driving me nuts. You ever gonna stop? Wait, you think it's me? Not me? But someone is pranking you pretty hard. Have you asked around? Yes, of course. No one's copying to it. I've asked everyone from the principal on down. No one will admit to it, so fess up and stop it. It's gone past cute and funny to like stalker stuff. It's definitely not me, promise. Obvious, obvious, obvious again. Well, a nutritious, nutritious conscious stalker at least. <laughs> and that's three, three obvious observations. I've been home one minute, a record even for you. Thanks, I pride myself on it. My guess is either one of your students or one of your assistants, mm, Rebecca maybe, or does she prank? Or 
Jameis Mashawawer? <clears throat> Not likely it's any of them. My kids are way too disabled to prank successfully. And my assistants know I hate red apples. And you love them. So it's you. Stop this, okay? This is my place of work. It's not a joke. What? How could I possibly put an apple on your desk before school? Go through the hood of my rental car. It hasn't been driven all day, let alone on the crack of dawn before you get up. I have to do it like at 3 a.m. in the morning. You know, th that city, it's at you all the time. Your point? It's making you insane. Not enough to prank you this bad. It's very serious. Have you asked for help, like, from anyone? Who do you propose I ask? The cops? The Apple police? What would I say? I mean, great point. Well, other than the Apple weirdness, how are you? I'm dealing. I'm not good yet, but not bad either. I miss my husband. I'm dealing with it. Well, I'm not sure if I should bring this up now, but how do you feel if I went back to New York soon? I've been there here for a while and I'm not much help with, with all of this, honestly. So maybe it's time for me to go home. You seem like you're handling it. <laughs> I'm fine. I'm not worried about me. But I have to admit, I would like you to stay another week or two, if you can. Just until I can figure out what's happening. Really? Uh, I'm just surprised because I've been here for a while, Ned, and I'm, I kind of have to get back. I, I can only get covered for so long. I'm basically jeopardizing my livelihood. My husband died. Someone's pranking me, badly. If it's really not you, then I need my family nearby. More time, please. Okay, got it. Too soon for me to scry. I miss my city and I'll call my boss and I'll try to. Please stay. I'll get the time off. I will. I think it was Keisha's first day at school. She was well. She was unruly at first. She seemed afraid, unhappy to be away from her home, from her family, I guessed. But I was wrong. There's a word for that. Anyway, when her mother came to pick her up from school on that very first day, I could see them from across the hallway. I was at my desk. I watched as Keisha's mother, I never learned her name, came through the glass doorway, leading to where Keisha was standing with our principal, Raina Gasford, a kind, gentle, good woman. And I saw it. The look on the mother's face, exasperation and disinterest, as if to say, nothing you will tell me now will be a surprise. My daughter did not fit in. She caused the fuss, she pulled out her hair. She cried all day and tore at the other children's clothes and tried to take them for herself. All things she does with me, her mother and her family every single day. And you will tell me, because I am Keisha's mother, that she cannot come back to the school anymore. And I will ask you where I can go. And you will tell me that you do not know. Suddenly, her face shifted from disinterest to concern. Keisha's mother saw that Keisha was wearing different clothes than the ones she came to school with that day. Keisha's mother became alarmed. She assumed the worst. She and I both did, we made a leap in our thoughts. It's, I 
again, it's that word I cannot recall. What? Then Raina quietly explained that Keisha had been placed in Charlene's class on her first day of school. And Charlene had given Keisha a new dress. A dress that she had in the classroom in case anyone spilled something or if finger painting became too exciting to be contained on a blank sheet of paper. Either way, whatever the reason, Keisha had wanted a dress that day. Her mother always made her wear pants for many reasons, I suppose. It made Keisha smile, the dress. So Charlene made certain Keisha was allowed to wear the dress home that day. Keisha stood next to the principal, quietly smiling, her face wiped clean of tears, her tummy full from a good lunch. But she had made three different paintings that day. All of them were of different dresses. Keisha's mother took her hand. She left for school that day, and when she returned, Keisha was wearing a brand new dress. I saw that she stayed in Charlene's classroom for all the years she was at Post-Seat. A happy ending. But then I learned that Charlene was gone from school one day, and then another, and then gone forever. 10 years later, so was I. When we're young, there's always too much time. But now that we are older, time feels like a dirty trick. Frank. For the last three months, Ned has been keeping it secret from Archer. By the time this happens, Charlene and I will have vanished into the earth. It's been three months, three long months, little brother. My boss is screaming at me, he's screaming at me. I don't want this. I know, I know, I know. Oh my God. I thought you said it stopped. Has it started again, the Apple thing? No, you don't know. You don't know, you didn't lose your husband. You do not fucking know. Now this. Yeah. I feel like I'm losing my mind. He's gone, my soldier, my love, gone. And I don't want this. I don't want you. I want Roger. I, I, I want my husband. I want my husband. I, I don't want to be all alone. Why, why would God make this shit happen in my life? Yeah. I used to lie awake at night. I'd say to myself over and over, all I want is this, this life, this man, my home, all I want, all I have. And then he took it all anyway, all of it. Fucking shithead, fucking useless skydiving. Why the fuck are you pranking me, Archer? I can't stand it, will you stop it, stop it? No, 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 it's not. It it is not me. I swear. I, I swear. Shit. You know, I wish it was me. I wish it was me because I could make it stop. You're, you're my little brother, and it's killing me that someone will do this to you. Killing me. And yes, God is a piece of shit. If he's anything, he's just a hetero contract of white privilege. So therefore, he's an evil motherfucker. That's God. Sky Daddy? <laughs> what the hell is a Sky Daddy? Well, it's what the kids on TikTok say for God, but it's like a total dickhead. I love it. <laughs> yeah, God is a Sky Daddy, <laughs> but not the universe. I promise you that, little brother. The universe is elegant. She's gorgeous, a wise creature, and a story to tell. And she has all the physics equations to back it up. This horrible, crazy time will pass. Maybe.
I like that idea. An elegant universe. I guess I always knew it wasn't you, big brother. <coughs> I know the apples aren't you, from you. Yeah, I thought they stopped briefly. Nothing for like three months and now they're back? It's weird. And the people we love are always with us. But I gotta get back to work. I know that's my seg, but I know I have to go. I won't have a job to get back to. Okay, but first check out the garage. Just go look, That then I have something to tell you. Okay. What is going on with all these apples? Don't tell me that these are from school. There's like a whole bushel full of them out here. Gotta be like a hundred. I thought you said it stopped. I thought it did too at first, but then I looked in the backseat of my car and it was just sitting there. The apple that I thought I threw away. The next day as I walked into the classroom, there was another one sitting on my desk. So I threw it away at school, but by the time I got home, it was on the seat next to me. I was a bit disoriented, confused, thought maybe I was dreaming or something. And then every day when I got to work, there was always another apple on my desk. If I threw it away, it stayed with me, either on the seat next to me or in the back seat of the car when I got home. And once in a while, if I got home and didn't see anything, I'd look in the glove compartment and there was always there, just one red delicious apple. It, it reminded me of something, but I couldn't remember what. So each day I just left the new one in the garage behind Roger's workbench. Why didn't you tell me? Were you scared? Not really. Uh, angry, very, very angry, but not scared. I think they're from mom. Mom's been gone for 20 years. It's just a bad hoax, a really bad one. It, no, I don't think so. I, I think it's to remind me of something, something I forgot maybe. No, that's called like signs that you don't connect. I'm sorry, but this doesn't make any sense. Exactly. I wanted to try it, take a bite, just one. Tell him to try it. Are you certain he's ready? It will change everything like it did for me. And you just couldn't have seen mom, Charlene. You couldn't have seen her with Keisha. You weren't on my school moms yet. And you hadn't graduated from college yet or falling in love yet. I am very sorry about Charlene. Your mother was a good woman. And your brother's husband was a good man. But it's time now. But go on. Tell him to take a bite. He's ready, as you were. Time to water in your plate, Ned. I know it's scary, but give it a try, please. Oh. This is good. <laughs> wow. Oh, wow. I had forgotten it's, oh, it's been a long time. So good. So good. So, so, so very, very good. Charlene was the first person to ask me if I was with child. I knew she was listening. So I told her the truth. 
that child remembers me to this day. When Archer returns to the Big Apple, he will write a play about me. I hope you will listen. End of play. I'm going to ask all of the actors uh, who are still on uh, to please turn their cameras on and I'm going to um, ask everyone else to leave their cameras off for the time being so we can give everyone uh, an unofficial or should say virtual curtain call. Thank you to all of our wonderful actors and also to thank our directors. Directors, please turn your cameras on also and the playwrights perhaps the most important person, people of all. So thank you, thank you, thank you all for your work uh, in today's performance. It's, um, it's been a tremendous working with all of you. Some of you I've gotten to know more than others, but uh, um, thanks again. What, what I'd like to do now is um, go through the plays in the order. And if every, everyone else uh, in the audience would like to turn their cameras on, they're welcome to. Um, what I'd like to do is go through the plays in the order they were performed. I know we had a switch in uh, order. Uh, and um, I'm going to uh, introduce the playwrights and then um, ask them some questions and talk to some of the actors and uh, directors as well about their experience working on this. Um, so we are going to start with Evan Edwards. Uh, this is the second time we've uh, had the pleasure to work together. Um, I'm just going to read uh, highlights because everyone has extensive resumes, but um, Evan is a member of the uh, DGA EA and ADVA. Um, as Stephen Hamilton, he earned a Bachelor of Arts in English and Theater from uh, Niagara University. Um, his works include a full-length uh, book musical for McQuirk's uh, Suicide Hall, a fictional account of actual events, for which he won the Great uh, Performances Fellowship and the Playlight Featured Musical Award. Um, his play Members of the Choir was chosen for the Broadway Inclusion Project in New York City. Um, he uh, Two of his monologues, Tonsil Hockey with the Help and Independent Thinking were featured at the Prince William Sound College Monologue Workshop. And um, his feature length uh, drawing room farce mixed messages is in development with the American Theater Group Play Lab uh, to name a few. So thank you, Evan, great to have you back. Um, and thank you for taking on the directing of your own play, <laughs> which I know is <laughs> interesting and we can talk about that a bit. Um, I've done it also and uh, it's both sort of easier and, and harder than you think it's going to be. Um, but uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, when we start just about the, um, your connection to the uh, milieu, to the location of, um, of rural Florida, um, is that a place or how did that inspire the story for you? Or did it? Uh, <laughs> I um, actually don't have a personal collection mm -hmm. to rural Florida, except mm -hmm. that uh, my father grew up there. He was born in Brooklyn and then they moved to not exactly rural Florida, but not urban Florida. And he went to school there and, you know, we always got the stories. I had to walk to school in the snow up three hills and I'm like, dad, it doesn't snow in Florida. Well, how'd you walk in the snow? <laughs> <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Um, so yeah, so I wanted to set something uh, down there and I thought this piece would be interesting set there as opposed to doing it somewhere, I don't want to say is normal, but like if it was set in South Carolina or Georgia, it would be something that was too familiar. Right. So, so I wanted to go for Florida because it's still down there, but <laughs> it's, it's a little different. Well, and I think sometimes writing like, you know, they, you know, that old, uh, notion, right, where you know science, is, it's exciting to write, but a, a place you don't actually know, because it can be very inspiring and it creates new energy, new, new, uh, new characters you hadn't thought of before. Um, what is the, it's interesting that, you know, we have two plays that in this program that in a way deal with magic realism, if you want to call it that, and I'm just curious what this play was, was about for you in the context of like, you know, gay pride and coming out in identity, um, what that, if that was something that was on your mind when you were writing this? Um, I, 
kind of peripherally it yeah the play is really um about breaking down the stereotypes of first of all what it is to be gay and what it was like to be gay in another time period that's something that a lot of uh younger lgbtq plus yeah. people don't realize because you know they have it great if you're you know in a fairly accommodating environment you can walk down the street holding hands with your boyfriend you can kiss your girlfriend in public you know those kinds of things whereas in 1946 you couldn't do that that was something that was more than frowned upon let's say um and so i wanted to to show that and also show a, a, an intersectional cross between the thoughts of what it was to be an african-american man and be gay and what it was to be a young white guy and be gay and how those things were parallel to each other at certain points in time. Right. You know, and back then they they would both be outcasts. And so they they had to hide and they had to, you know, keep their relationship, if you want to call it that, um, really on the down low. Because not only was, you know, it gay, here it was this interracial relationship mm -hmm. on top of everything else. So it just added uh, added another layer to visibility and and who we are as LGBTQ plus people along with BIPOC AAPI people. Right. There could almost be another uh, story about the Caleb and Boy uh, character, <laughs> like you want to see almost. The, the the continuation of that moment in the play and that's what's great about you know wonderful short works like this is that you're like wanting more um so well thank you um i'd love to talk to uh, your actors briefly um let's uh let me get everyone's name right arthur um what it was like what was it like to play franklin for you it was very interesting when evan came to me um and gave me the script um, I saw the whole time warp thing very interesting to portray, especially in regards to, as he was saying, not only it being a gay relationship, but an interracial one as well. Mm -hmm. Going back in those times, which was at that time, 1946, essentially I had to put myself in young Franklin's body and in my mind live every interracial incident that went up to 2006, as well as every gay relationship that went up to 2006. And those parallels were interesting to follow as I was creating my character. Well, it, you mentioned like the, the, the time warp aspect to the story. It's interesting because when you do that in this context, you see how things are so similar in a way from the 40s and haven't changed as much as we think. So well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that detail. And um, let's see, uh, City, we'll get to talk to you twice, but let's uh, ask a little bit about your your feelings about um, Caleb. Yeah, sure. Um, I thought Caleb was a really interesting character, um, both from coming from his place of privilege of being mm -hmm. white in the 40s and yeah. also being like the son of the mayor. And we were talking about it one time in rehearsal of how um, like how he is coming from this privilege and how his life as a gay guy in the 40s has to be hidden. And I remember reading the script for the first time being like, oh, this is like a really great piece because it's like a very much of a reflection of sort of what's going on now and today with um, like Pride and with the Black Lives Matter movement. Yeah. And again, and was like, oh shoot, I have to do this in a Southern accent, which I don't think I can do very well. So, um, I thought you did brilliantly. All, all of you did. So yeah, good you. work. Yeah. But yeah I, I really love the piece and Evan was a great writer and he was great at giving notes for how to deliver the lines. Yeah. 
Great. Um, let's, uh, Brendan, you have this wonderful moment at the end of the play. And um, what, what was your, uh, how did it feel for you playing this particular character, particularly of when he comes in in the story? Yeah, I mean, when I come in, clearly I don't know who he's talking to. So I, everything is kind of normalized for mm -hmm. me. Um, and I know that we have this secret that we're hiding together. And this is a moment that I've been waiting for. I've been waiting for this kiss, right, with him. Um, so for me, having that, it's like today when, you're, when you go on a date, like you're waiting up to see if the spark is still there. Like you talked, you talked, you talked, and then now we kiss and ah, oh, yes, but you don't know what's happening after the fact. And the fact that I don't know what's happening is cringy and sad, but great job. But it's, it's, it sucks um, because I feel for, I feel for young Franklin. I really do. Cause I don't know how I would have survived in the past. I don't know. Exactly. And we, you know, when we get to play characters like this, um, we're both grateful to be in their shoes. And then sometimes we're kind of glad that we're not <laughs> afterwards and we can return to our lives, but with like a new appreciation for the journeys that they took and how, they, how it relates to ours. So, well, listen, thank you. Uh, we're, we need to keep moving in the sake of time, but um, great work, everyone. Very, very strong piece. I hope that we'll have the opportunity to see it again in person if, for those that are wherever the play is performed. So thanks again. And uh, we're gonna move on to Letter to Derek and um, Michael Alberstadt. Um, Michael is a Michigan-based screenwriter with uh, one produced script and eight others waiting in the wings. He is a member of the Farmington Players Community Theater and writes for the stage with their Barn Scribes group, often writing short plays as part of their monthly challenge program. Uh, Michael focuses on dramatic scripts with authentic LGBT characters and stories that make the audience feel something. You know, we can certainly uh, say that that happened in your play. He lives with his husband, Frank and Dog Snickers. I love that name in Royal Ogutside, uh, Motor City. Michael, great to have you here. Thank you. And, um, yeah. Um, I'd love to talk about this play in the context of high school and jockism and about sports in the LGBTQ community. And I think in an email you sent to me this week, you had sort of mentioned that. And I was trying to find the email quickly to see what you said, because it was very, it was very interesting. But what what um, and then of course in the context of school violence, and it's there's like a lot happening in this very personal story. And I love plays like this where it takes you know, a really small point of view and addresses all these issues without us even realizing it. So I don't know any of those things you want to talk about or, or anything else. Um, you know, uh, it's interesting, the sports issue, the sports angle, because um, when I went to high school, I was not a sporto. I was a theater geek, you know, yeah. kind of like I am now. So um, I always enjoyed sports and growing up in Michigan, of course, hockey was all around us. So I, I, um, really got involved in that. And then I got, uh, I was a graphic designer and a marketing guy, and I got involved with the gay um, hockey team, a national gay hockey team, and I did marketing for them for a while. And I heard their stories, and um, I was just, um, I mean, they really draw you in. Most of them, uh, thankfully, um, end very well. You know, it's, uh, they come out to some teammates, and then they come out to their parents and that kind of thing. Um, there were a number, uh, several of them that came out uh, really horribly. Uh, one particularly is a, a guy named Greg, who is a football player um, in Pennsylvania. Um, he tried to commit suicide. He ended up in the hospital. The nurse read his chart and told her son why he was in the hospital, because he kind of came out to her, her. And her son was on his football team, and he told the football team and the football team essentially said, get off the team or we're gonna do something terrible to you. So, um, so that stuff does happen. And um, so sports stories and gay sports stories have always drawn me in. So um, I've always had this idea of doing something with a, 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 a football player and a mascot. I don't know why I am drawn in by that, but I like the idea of the mascot um, being behind the cover um, and, 
acting outside of himself because nobody can tell who he is. So, mm -hmm. and I think gay people are very familiar with that story. So, because they yeah, have to do the same thing. Go ahead. Yeah, they have to do the same thing. So, um, and the school violence thing, it's just, it seemed like a, a good way to tie it in. You know, I think there's a lot of these shooting incidents um, where you don't realize what the, the stories are behind the people, you know, um, and you hear some of them and you just assume a lot about them, but it's inevitable that there's probably a story like this out there. You know, so much, there's so much behind the character you never hear about. And I thought I'd bring that out. So they, they did seem to tail in together pretty well. Yeah. I, I mean, I, my partner and I were just talking about this a few hours ago about, you know, how, um, you know, you, you, you hear about or see movies about, you know, certain issues around, around violence and um, you think it's like an other, like it's out there. And then suddenly when it happens to somebody you know, even indirectly, it really changes your view of, it, it, per, it becomes personal in a whole different way. And you're like, oh, this is actually real. This is something that, that, and that's the beauty of drama, you know, I think. And if a play like yours is that it does personalize it for us through this character that might be fictitious and yet, they're real, we, we, they're, they're larger, larger than life. We get, you know, what they're going through and therefore the other issues about, you know, come out through this emotionality that we have with the character. Absolutely. And I just want to say, I, I thought the, the uh, Bruce and uh, City did a, a wonderful job with it. So yeah. I was very happy with what you guys did, so. And speaking of Bruce and City, Bruce, um, uh, it was, uh, I was thrilled that you were able to take this on and of course, you know, always the opportunity to, to work together even in, in a context where I wasn't at rehearsals, but um, what did this play uh, mean to you when you read it? Or what, what was your response? Well, you know, I always have a little, I think, PTS around high school issues. Yeah. And, and definitely remember, you know, some of the worst homophobic things that happened to me around jocks. Mm -hmm school but also the most erotic thoughts you know about jocks as well and if you know interesting um so um and because it just seems like at this point right now i'm dealing with end of life friends who are close to the end of life and the the surrealness of being in front of a body, in, in front of a, a, a friend, a dear friend who has passed, uh, and, and all the emotions and confessions and last rites that come out um, when you confront death. Mm -hmm. So um, that, that really, and, and you know, working with City was like a dream. You know, um, he already understood the emotional things underneath it and anyway it was a pure pleasure and thank you michael for a beautiful thank, thank you city uh you had to take on a lot this was you know do have you have you performed monologues like this before uh no not wow like yeah well you certainly you know you know the thing about doing a monologue i don't think i've done a lot either but i think you know you really have to carry a whole play it's all about you and it's very challenging and i thought you did it so effortlessly and um i uh was just curious about your your feelings about dealing working with this character particularly since you're the around closer to the age of the character than any of us are and and how it spoke to you from your own experience yeah so as someone who's still in high school mm -hmm. um, like the idea of a school shooting is still terrifying to me. Mm -hmm. um, like I've had friends die of gun violence and even the idea of going back next year for my senior year and like the possibility of a school shooting is still something that unfortunately is on my mind. So, um, and the, the detail in the script about it being on Valentine's Day, even though it wasn't um, specific to what happened in Florida a few years ago, it was still mm -hmm. something that just caught my mm -hmm. attention. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, but um, it was because it was such a well a well written character who was very much like a high school student. I could see at my own school, it was very easy to kind of get in that mindset. Even though I can't relate to some of the things he went through and some of his actions, I can still. Uh, he was very human, and it was very easy to bring that out in some ways. 
Well, and I think as you were saying the, you know, even though it wasn't your story per se, the, the reality that Michael created was something that you could obviously connect to because it was so, so well developed and strong. So great. Well, thank you. Uh, we're going to move on to the next play, but um, again, a pleasure to work with all of you and uh, best of luck. We'll stay in touch, hopefully. Thank and you. Um, yeah, Alfonso Ramirez, look at he split. Alfonso is originally from Los Angeles. He now resides in New York City as an actor playwright. Um, he, uh, some of his uh, credits uh, or education include uh, attending U USC, the BFA program, a bachelor's degree at the New School, MFAW in playwriting, Goddard College, um, NYFA grant, um, Arizona Theater Company National Hispanic Play Award, Many Voices Project, um, the Hispanic Playwrights Project, uh, South Coast uh, Repertory uh, Publications, and uh, two anthologies, um, sorry, I don't have this spelled out correctly, and a Positive Negative, a Women of Color and HIV AIDS. I, I'm assuming those are topics that you address in your work. I think I pulled this from your new play exchange, <laughs> but, or no, you sent it to me, okay. Right, they were all pieces that were written based on um, positive, negative with about women who got have HIV or are a, a issues around HIV and AIDS. Right, got it. It's Thank you. Yeah. Um, can you? I know that the sort of evolution of this play because I saw it at another festival, but I'm wondering if you could sort of tell us everything that happened with it uh, briefly. <laughs> but it's an interesting story, so. My friend Debbie Finkelstein had written a, a Zoom play for some people in, in Colorado and they'd asked her if she could hire or get four other, three other writers to write a piece that would set post COVID in a beauty salon and each of us would write one 10 minute scene. One character would be an extant character would be the salon owner would be Hector and each of us would create a new character. So they loved the three other pieces but they didn't think their audience space would take to take very kindly to a trans character. So they kind of like were wishy-washy. So we all said, we're not doing it. So then we decided to develop it on our own and it was done at BAD, Bronx Academy of Art and Dance. Um, it was produced there and we did the Zoom reading of it, I think a couple months ago. And I think that's where you saw it. Yes. So that was the first time we were able to get it on its feet. And since then we've gotten together to try to expand this uh, 40 minute piece into a longer piece. So adding characters, uh, and expanding on the scene, but we haven't quite finalized that yet. So we're still at this point where you saw the play tonight. Um, I think, you know, what's interesting is the, um, you know, looking at this and, you know, having the having had the pleasure to work with these two strong, really strong actors, you know, what is the, um, yeah, what, what, what do they want from, what do they want from each other, you know? What, what does Nancy want other than, uh, you know, obviously, you know, someone to pay for her procedure, but what, what else is going on for these? And then what does Hector want? You know, what, why did he, you know, shun his son uh, at that point? And um, what, how do you see these characters? Because I think they're, they're written, you know, it's contemporary. And yet um, we still see this kind of issues happen in families where right? it's not like we're you know, we've evolved to the point where that doesn't happen anywhere. Um, but I, I'm just curious if that was what you were, you know, in, interested in writing about or where, where you saw these characters and is there, is there hope for them in their relationship? <laughs> well, the idea that he was an only child and that the father had said so much story by this young man who ended up not being a young man at all mm -hmm. was probably very, um, I, you know, looking at it from Hector's perspective, it's probably quite disappointing and of course, being Jordan and knowing that you're not living up to your parents' expectations and knowing that you don't have your mother there to protect you and or coddle you. And that's one of the scenes that I've written is an earlier scene where the mother is still alive. She's getting mm -hmm. chemotherapy and um, he walks in, Jordan walks in and says, oh, can I help you with your makeup? So they do each other's makeup and hair. And that's the first time that the mother realizes that Jordan is not the child she's always thought. So that's another scene. but. That feeds into the final scene where um, it turns out that the godmother is the one that he's been living with all this time. There's another woman that they lend money to uh, to open a shop, and she's the end ends up being the woman who takes care of Jordan slash Nancy during those few years that she's kind of like a, a lost character out there. 
Right, sorry, I realized I had to turn Hector's, uh, excuse me, Mark's video on because I turned it, I had to turn it off for him and he can turn it back on himself. Um, what, um, I, I, what, one comment I just wanted to make about, because um, I, of course, Debbie Finkelstein and I are dear friends, and that's how you and I connected. And we were talking about this, about, you know, these institutions that underestimate their audiences and say, oh, they're not gonna be able to take this subject matter and you know it's it's a shame that that's all and I'm, and I unfortunately have heard of that happening a lot recently in, in other festivals where they're not wanting certain kinds of content. Um, I had a, a sort of similar thing happen kind of where um, this I had submitted a bunch of plays to this festival and all but one were LGBTQ themed and the one that wasn't was the one they said we'll consider this one. Mm. Meaning we won't consider the other ones <laughs> was the theme. So um, I, again, I, I think I don't think it's the audience. I think it's the you know some of the people making these decisions in charge that, right. that think they have to do a certain kind of you know that the, the audience is not going to be able to take you know anything other than what they know. And I think that's baloney. But they're that's giving them an edible menu is what they're saying. Right. So I think I, you say they're they're underestimating their audience base, but also it's their loss because for me. Yeah. A theater experience begins when I leave the theater, when I start to put yes. together and, and digest what I've just seen and, and think about it all and piece it together. And, and it's those minutes after I leave the theater where, where I, I learned something or I, mm -hmm. I feel like I've been exposed to something that I never thought I would be exposed to. So I think that in a way, this would be a chance to see what a real relationship between a father and a child can be like that's uh, toxic, I guess would be the word. Yeah. Um, well, I'm glad that you're, you know, that this is being developed and I hope that we'll be able to see a, you know, another version of it at some point. And um, thank you. I'm glad that, you know, we were able to connect in the way that we did. And um, New friends. Exactly. Uh, what could be better? So let's talk to our actors. Uh, yes. Mark, uh, what is um, your character? I mean, I, you know, it's, it's so interesting when you write a short play because so much has to happen in a short amount of time. And I think... The, the characters have to evolve in a in a in the story has to evolve in 10, 15 minutes. Um, and I, you know, Alfonso does such a, a brilliant job of doing that in this version that it's at. But I'm curious for you, um, your your character really does come a long way from the beginning and end of the play, don't you think? Or would you I think so? A differently? Yeah. yeah. I think uh, um yeah. part of it, um, what hits him is guilt. Yeah. An enormous amount of guilt because he puts his grieving, his traumatized son out of the house because basically his son brought back memories of his wife. You know, I mean, it wasn't just the fact, he didn't even know that his son um, had gender dysphoria, but just that he brought uh, memories. And it's an enormous amount of guilt because um, as a father, I know I once heard this um, expression and I agree with it, no matter how old they get, that's your baby. So you, he threw his baby out because his baby wasn't living up to his standards. And you carry that guilt with you for, forever when you do something like that, you have to. And yet he made the decision at that time to do it. But yeah. I, you know, what I think was interesting is that this play is set you know, during COVID and you know, it's a time when a lot of us are really reflecting on what was important to us. Mm -hmm. so I think the fact that it's said at that time is very apropos that yeah. these characters would have this, particularly for you, this kind of you know revelation of, and and uh, and uh, analysis evaluation about their choices they've made. Yeah. Um, a lot of us did in the last year because we had mm -hmm. time to, and the world was changing. So, um, River, I'd love to talk to you a bit about um, you know Nancy and what it was like for you playing this character. Did you, uh, how did you find your way into, into her, so to speak, as we have to do as actors? Right. Uh, <laughs> I try to just have a lot of compassion for, you know, the character that I'm playing and the characters that are playing with me, right? Um, and I think for, for me to connect to Nancy was just to love her, honestly, because she has been so love starved. That's really what's been going on. And so mm -hmm. approaching it from that place was really beautiful and it was difficult. Some of the themes that are present in the play are certainly themes that I had to deal with when I was growing up, like the pressure of masculinity. Um, 
I do not identify solely with my feminine side as an actor or person, um, but it is definitely the one that's most inaccessible just because it's not widely accepted. Um, but I also had a lot of compassion for Hector. I mean, as a person, not necessarily as Nancy, um, myself, I think alcoholism ultimately comes from places of hurt and pain, you know, and it, it, it is a disease, you know, and it is a struggle. Um, and so that layer for me was another place where I was like, okay, this is where I get to love Hector too, you know, because ultimately I think that's what brings them together. It was a joy to play this character for sure. Mm -hmm. And it definitely showed. You were fantastic, by the way, both of you just, I love this. And Thank I'm thinking you. in a, in a way that, 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 um, that Nancy's leaving was probably one of the best things that ever happened to both of them because it was a slap in the face to Hector, he stopped drinking. And it was, a, you know, she was able to begin her journey as a person she wanted to be. I mean, I was never close to my family in LA, but it was because of that marginalization that I existed in LA that made me move to New York on my own without knowing the soul. It made me do all kinds of things because I wasn't linked, I wasn't attached. I didn't have that umbilical cord. So it, it was as much as I resented and regretted not having a family that supported me, I felt like that facilitated my becoming the person that I am today, which is a good thing, I hope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so, I I mean, our, to that too. <laughs> yeah, our, our families influence, influence us in ways we don't always realize as long as still we're much older. Um, and I, I loved River when you talked about loving the character because I think, you know, it's sometimes easy to judge the characters we play. And I think when you do that, you're kind of boxing them into a hole <laughs> and you're not allowing them to kind of breathe. And I think, you know, it is, that's one of the really wonderful things about acting is having like a love affair with the character you're playing. And, you know, I've had, I've had experiences like that too, where, you know, I miss the character after, you know, a period of time. And that's when I know, I think I might've gotten it right because I was that connected, but. Um, well, listen, thank you all. Um, I'm glad that we, uh, Alfonso got to, got to do this play again and that I had such a talented, you know, act, talented actors to work with. And I always say this every program that I'm just lucky that we had such an amazing, you know, talented group of people that were willing to, to work with me on this. So thank you again. I hope we get to work together again and stay in touch as I have said several times already uh, today. <laughs> and we're gonna move on to the final uh, play, uh, delayed, but finally uh, fortunately performed in its entirety the way it was meant to be. Apophenia, uh, let's talk a little bit about um, Bill. Bill Crouch is an award-winning playwright, actor, director, and producer. He has an MA in, in theater history, uh, theory and criticism from CUNY, and the arts administration degree from NYU. He's a proud member of AEA, SAG-AFTRA, member of the Drama League and the Dramatist Guild, um, and also it's a dramatic criticism. Bill, great to, great to have you back. We had we were fortunate to perform Parking Lot Christian several months ago. Well, I'm just so lucky to know you guys. I, you know, first of all, thanks for surviving that tech. You know, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> you guys all hung in there. It's really beautiful. Um, and I just want to say to Teddy and Jennifer, Jonathan and Cedric, you guys, you know, wow, beautiful job. You know, I'm deeply humbled that you guys just signed on for this. And I, I'm an actor myself. I know how much work it is to, to grapple with uh, these scripts that had asked so much of you in such a short period of time. Thank you, Aaron. Oh, Another, you. you know, thank you so much. Yeah, no, absolutely, Bill. It's a pleasure. And um, I want to ask you about the title. What does it mean? Well, <laughs> apophenia is a, you know, apophenia is a word that it, it just very simply means when we connect things that don't connect, oh, when right. we connect, we see signs and things that actually aren't connected. But I thought, you know, that sort of, it's sort of a, that word judges itself very harshly, right? When we say someone is, you know, using apophenia uh, or, or uh, sub, you know, they're, they're connecting things that don't connect, that's a judgment. And I, I loved that maybe, you know, right now, I try to write plays that, that, that talk to us about uh, that we need to see right now. Maybe, you know, it's a play about survival. So maybe in order to survive, whatever we're going through right now, we might connect things that don't really connect, 
but that might be what we need to do without any judgment or any assumption. And um, so an apple appears on your desk and you start to worry about it. <laughs> Why? It's just an apple, right? It can't hurt you. And yet it really bothers Ned a lot. And I, you know, so that's what that's, I saw somebody say something really mean too about Red Delicious Apples online. And I thought, I love Red Delicious Apples. I'm going to write a play about that. God, people have nothing better to write about. Um, <laughs> Facebook. Um, well, um, and it's interesting because I think, you know, connecting things that don't, don't necessarily have an initial connection, you know, is in a way the basis of like magic realism that I know you like to write about. And your, your other play also is about that. And it's, you know, creating our, our own uh, realities and our own belief systems based on, you know, our own perceptions of things or needs that we have, right? Mm -hmm. We need to connect these things for whatever reason. Um, so I found that very, very interesting. Um, what, uh, it's, I think it's, I think the play is also dealing with grief in a very interesting way as well. Like, you know, this perception happens because there's a, there's a coping that has to happen about a loss. And that kind of colors the whole play in a way. Would you, would you agree with that? Or that this play is dealing with grief as one of the sort of the underlying issues? Yeah, I think it's dealing with a lot of stuff. And um, that's why I was thrilled that we had Cedric because uh, Cedric directed the last piece for you guys. And he's able to handle a lot of, you know, a lot of, a lot of layers. Let's just put it that <laughs> way. So I would love, love to hear from Cedric. Yes. Cedric, you're off. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> I think you're muted, though. We can't hear you. Sorry about that. I'm That's all right. More. Um, the first couple of reads, um, it, it was hard to, it was hard to really grasp all the layers. But it was actually just listening to the actors just read, and the information just came pouring out. The broken relationship, the need for connection, the need for, you know, the continuation of life. I mean, you know, we, we spoke, I spoke with both the actors and then, you know, I said, that apple needs to mean more than just, I like, I remember apples. I remember I love apples. I mean, there was a loss. Uh, I remember I like living. I remember that there's a life to live. I remember that, you know, my husband would have wanted me to be happy. And, you know, and I remember that I love my brother and my brother was my comfort. And I remember that, you know, things have to keep moving forward. And the monologues in between were just a magnificent walk through the relationship. And the relationship between the teacher and the mother, the, it was just a one, it was a great connection. I found so much connection in the text. So I had fun with it. <laughs> yeah, it definitely showed. Jennifer, I'd love to talk to you about Michaela because yeah, she does have a very interesting place in this story. Um, as the kind of almost like a narrator <laughs> in a way, in a way. But what was that like for you playing, playing her in, in the context of a, you know, two brothers and then being the sort of omniscient figure almost in a way? Yeah, I thought that uh, she was really interesting to, pl to play. I've thought a lot for some, some odd reason since the pandemic, I've thought a lot about time and space and our mm -hmm. presence in it and life and death and um, and how we're all sort of a present in life and how we're all kind of taking in these experiences. We're seeing these experiences. And I'm wondering, you know, when we pass on, if we pass on, what um, what is our presence then? You know, yeah. I feel like Michaela was this presence that she was always there and she always inserted herself in different ways. And mm -hmm. one of the ways was this apple. And so for me, like living through, you know, as she was telling these experiences, she was also living them too. And she was reflecting on them as she was experiencing them as well. So there was, you know, you talk about the layers there and we talk yeah. about when we're in, you know, just being ourselves, you know, how can we, as we're living in the moment, step back and experience what we're seeing, but also take it in as well. So. I did, yeah, I really connected with her. Beautifully, beautifully put. Um, Jonathan, you, you're, I was just curious about your thoughts and what I was saying about grief, which I thought you played really beautifully. Although I do think you need to call your internet provider. 
Um, no, it's actually not my internet. So, oh, you know, you're it. <laughs> so uh, this weekend I am at family friends. And, oh, got it. So, yeah, apologies. I was, I was kidding. I was kidding. That it it <laughs> happens. It's one of the one of the hazards of doing Zoom theater. You just have to deal with it. So <laughs> anyway, yeah, just just in terms of what I was talking about about you know grief and and you know what Ned was you know feeling about um, how he was coping with that through this this scenario, if that was something you were working with. Um, yeah, so it was trying to, uh, I have not lost a husband before, but mm -hmm. it was trying to communicate all the times of loss that I have felt in life and trying to find all those little moments in which mm -hmm. you, you grieve, you, you miss, you celebrate simultaneously because in the grief process, it's not just a woe is me, woe is what happened to them, but it's also, it's a lot of memories of what you had with that person and how they affected you in your life. Um, mm -hmm. And trying to bring those together, but in a direct yet dif diffuse way. Um, so I was trying to find how, mm, uh, in this particular case, the, the character would probably be very distracted at the same time, thinking of all of these memories while emoting them um, was how a great deal of my approach was. And um, let's talk to you, Teddy, about Archer. Um, and uh, did you feel you were support a supportive brother? <laughs> Um, well, I approached it like he was, but he didn't have the privilege of just like, oh, let me stay here for a year until my brother yeah. gets back on his feet, right? Because, you know, he has to work. And I relate to that a lot because now that I'm doing different things where people are like, do this internship for a year for no money. Like, yeah. you know, it's like, who can do that? Like, I have to pay rent. So all of those things kind of layer together on like, I, bro, I still care for you, but you, your grieving needs to like be faster. That's how gonna, I approach it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, I'm sorry that I stopped, but I really wanted to do right by Bill and, you know, listen to our words because they were so beautiful. Yeah. So I'm glad we got it together at the end. Yes, and um, <laughs> it, uh, um, I, fortunately I can cut that part out of the YouTube video. So be beauties of making a, you know, this technology easy for someone like me. Um, well, listen, we have a few minutes um, and I just want to see if anyone in the audience that has stayed on has any questions. Um, what you can do is if you move your cursor to the reactions button at the bottom of your screen, you can click on hand raise and I will go through the list of participants and see if anyone has their hand raised. Going once going twice. Okay, we have somebody I can't, the last name is Smitty? Well, the last name is Smith, actually, Lawrence G. Smith. Smith. I'm a friend of Bill's, actually, from a couple of years ago in college. Um, I do have a question, Bill, just about the uh, brothers, I'm sorry, Archer's ability. He, he can speak to um, Charlene, he can speak to, I'm sorry, Michaela. He's yeah. able to hear her, basically. Can you hear me okay? Bill, did you hear the question? No, I didn't hear the question. I'm sorry, oh, guys. Sorry, you'll have to repeat it. <laughs> so Michaela and um, Archer can hear Michaela. They're in contact. Only at the end. Gotcha. And there's a, there's some stage directions there that, that, that hopefully help that we didn't get. Um, and she raises up an apple. She holds her hand up as if she's holding an apple. And that's when things sort of change. Awesome. OK. I was just making, that's what I thought happened actually. And I should have trusted myself, I guess. <laughs> yeah, you're a good theater person. You're a great actor. So trust yourself, absolutely. <laughs> okay, cool. No, well done. I'll be sending you in uh, Facebook in a little while. Thank you. Okay, that was my question. That was it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. Okay. Thank you so much for coming, brother. Oh, sure. Is there any other questions? I have a question. Yeah. Why didn't Alfonso Ramirez acknowledge air and Lemon's direction of these peaks that would so Oh, you know, I, so I wear so many hats that, oh, you know. Told, they never thank you. <laughs> oh, people. it's, you know, when, when you're working with, you know, such strong material and, and actors, you know, the, the, the direction is more like, you know, 
giving say hey did you think about this or look at this um but uh thank you it, it was a pleasure to work on i i really wanted to take it on because i enjoyed seeing it so much in the other festival and um uh i think it it it's you know i love plays like yours that are dealing with you know real life situations real characters in a kind of realistic setting that you know there's no pretense it's just this is the story and uh those are the kind of that's the kind of theater I like. I like you know other kinds of theater too, but in terms of working on it from a director's standpoint, it, it's something that I can sort of in my capacities take on. So of course, was there a particular challenge for you in terms of this piece that, from of the pieces you've done? No, I'm no um, I'm moderate moderator. I Let's actually talk about I that. <laughs> well, oh, you mean in terms of directing? Um, you know, I actually didn't find this challenging to work on just because I sort of we all kind of clicked together as a group and we all kind of. We responded to each other and it was it was actually not that that hasn't happened before but i think um uh i mean i think the challenge in this play and i think you and i talked about this is making sort of you know hector sympathetic um and uh i i didn't find that an issue and you know uh, uh river commented on that too um and maybe it was also the way mark was playing there wasn't it could have been done in another taken another direction yeah. where we don't really sympathize with him where we you know but i think in any kind of theater, even someone that does something as, you know, cruel as Hector had done before, we want to see another side too, because people are three dimensional. There's never, they change. And right. Right. we want to see that evolution, so. And I'll just interject here and say that Aaron was um, a joy to work with, as always. Oh. And that was just really, really, just such a fun experience for me. And I grew so much from, I guess all of the notes that I received, it was like such a deep- I heard he's a monster to work with. I heard he's really yeah. impossible. <laughs> Ter terrible, terrible. Mercurial, throws <laughs> things at the screen. That's what I've heard. It's the only way to do it. So, um, well, thank you, River, and, and a pleasure also. Uh, River was in a, a monologue that we did about Sylvia Rivera, the Stonewall activist a few uh, months ago. And obviously has a lot of uh, versatility in what she does. So um, we, we love working with people like that. Okay, um, I don't think, I, if it doesn't look like there's any more questions. So I am uh, going to say goodbye. And um, of course, not forever. I hate to uh, say this will be our last one forever, but certainly it'll, it'll be for a while and we'll see where virtual theater lives uh, this fall and into the winter, if it's something that will continue. And um, again, if we have a group of plays that we wanna do, we'll certainly, uh, you'll be hearing from us again. But thank you all for all your support, participation, and um, happy Gay Pride. Still a few more hours left. Um, and um, we'll see you all online or in the future at some point. And you'll certainly all stay in my thoughts until then. So be well, everyone. Signing off. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.